Hey y'all, I'm Sir Pinkbeard, and in today's video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about the bevel modifier. Let's get started. If you're familiar with the bevel tool found in edit mode, then you pretty much know how the bevel modifier works. The biggest difference between the edit mode tool and the modifier is that once you adjust your bevel via the operator panel in edit mode, you are stuck with it. Whereas the modifier allows you to work non-destructively, meaning you can continue adjusting the bevel as needed until you apply the modifier. Let's add in a modifier and start looking at the base settings for it. Once you add one to the modifier stack, you can immediately see that all the edges of the cube have been beveled according to the amount, segments, and limit method values of the modifier. Now the reason the edges are all beveled on our cube is that the edges box is selected. If you switch that to vertices, then the bevel modifier will only apply to the vertices on our cube. Now the amount of bevel is affected by the amount slider and whatever width type you have selected. Basically, the size of the bevel will increase or decrease as you adjust the amount slider. Next, we have the segment slider, which, as you may have guessed, controls the number of segments or edges created by the bevel. So now that we've talked about those, let's talk about the width type and how it affects the amount. To really see how the width types work, let me add in another cube and turn on wireframe and x-ray so that we can easily see the changes. By default, the width type is set to offset, which means that the amount value will be the distance to the new edge from the original edge. So as you can see by the annotation line, the distance from the original edge to the new edge on either side of the bevel is the offset distance. The next width type is width, and width is just the distance between the two new edges formed by the bevel, or the edges on either side of the bevel if there is more than one segment. The annotation line that I've drawn represents the width, so even if you have more than one segment and the bevel has some curve or shape, the width is always going to be the distance between these two outermost edges. Next up is depth. Depth is the perpendicular distance between the new face that is created and the original edge as shown by the annotation line. After depth we have percent. This is the percentage of the adjacent edge length that the new bevel edges should slide along. So when we do 25%, the new bevel edge slides along 25% of the top edge. As we approach 50, you can see the lines intersect with each other and clamp. That's because we have clamp overlap enabled in the geometry section of the modifier. If we unclamp, we can take that bevel to 100%, which inverts our shape. Last and probably least, we have the absolute width type, which is the exact distance along edges adjacent to the bevel edge. The difference between absolute and offset is only visible when beveling angles that do not meet at a perfect 90 degrees. So now that we've seen all the width types, let's talk about the limit methods. By default, the limit method is set to angle and the angle is set to 30 degrees. Now the angle limit method limits the beveling to angles that are above the stated degree, in this case 30, and up to 180 degrees. If we change the angle to around 100 degrees, you can see that no angles are beveled any longer since our cube is just right angles. This limit method is intended to allow you to bevel only the sharp edges of an object without affecting its smoother surfaces. Then we have the limit method none. This doesn't limit the bevel by any criteria, so all edges or vertices will be beveled according to the other settings on the modifier. And next we have the weight limit method. Now the weight option is a bit more involved than angle and requires you to individually adjust edge bevel weights to apply the bevel modifier. To adjust the edge's bevel weight, you need to tab into edit mode on your object and then bring up the viewport properties panel with the N key. Make sure you're on the item tab and then select an edge. You'll then see the bevel weight property for that edge on the item tab. Simply adjust that weight and the bevel modifier will apply to that edge proportionally to the weight that you choose. While this is an option, I don't think you'll use it that much once I show you the next limit method, vertex groups. In order to talk about vertex groups, let's take a look at this slightly more complicated dumbbell that I've modeled. If you're not familiar with vertex groups, they are basically a named group of vertices on your model. Now you can access these groups by going to the object data properties tab and then the vertex groups dropdown. I've already got a vertex group here, and if I hit select, you can see the vertices contained inside that vertex group. But let's go ahead and add in another by hitting the plus button and then renaming the group. Then grab the vertices you want to add to that group and hit assign. Once you hit assign, those vertices belong to that group and can be selected and deselected with the respective buttons. Now we have two vertex groups on our object and we can properly take a look at the limit vertex group methods. So if we choose a vertex group from the dropdown, the modifier will only apply to that vertex group and not to the rest of the model. Now while the limit method usually applies the modifier settings to a particular 
particular vertex group, you can invert the influence of the modifier to apply it to all other vertices except the vertex group by hitting the invert button next to the vertex group name. Now, since we have two vertex groups, we can actually add multiple bevel modifiers to the object and apply bevels independently to each group. If you have multiples of the same modifier applied to an object, I highly recommend renaming each modifier to what it's affecting. And now that the base settings are taken care of, let's take a look at the profile settings. The profile settings are pretty straightforward, since there's just two options, Super Ellipse and Custom. Super Ellipse is the default setting, and it creates a bevel with a uniform convex or concave form, which is adjustable via the shape slider. If you want a more intricate bevel, you'll need to switch over to Custom. Custom gives you access to the miter editor, allowing you to create custom bevel shapes using nodes. Now, Custom also comes with four presets that you can choose and a default option, which allows you to create your own bevel shape. If you select a preset and you don't see the full bevel shape on your model, it's likely because you don't have enough segments. So increase your number of segments to at least the number of nodes in the miter editor, and you'll see the whole shape. If you create custom bevels, you should know that the editor shape will be applied from the bottom right to the top left, as you can see from how the cornice molding is applied on our dumbbell. Now, if we change the preset to steps and then adjust the segments, you'll see that new loops get added in. But if we wanted to increase the number of steps, we'd have to click the apply preset button that's appeared. That apply preset button occurs for both the steps and support loops presets and must be hit in order to regenerate both of those presets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you switch the preset back to default, you can create your own bevel shape, which you can do by left clicking in the miter editor to add in nodes. Then you apply different levels of control to those nodes by changing the node type and moving them around. You can move the nodes around in two ways, by clicking and dragging, or by moving them around via the X or Y values at the bottom of the miter editor. The final options are sample straight edges and sample even lengths, which try to do what their names suggest, create straight edges and even links between each bevel segment. So let's switch shapes again to show off the geometry settings. Starting with the miter settings, we have options for both inner and outer miters. Now a miter is formed when two beveled edges meet at an angle. The side where the angle is greater than 180 degrees is called an outer miter. And if the angle is less than 180 degrees, it's an inner miter. So let's switch into wireframe mode and show these off. The default setting for both inner and outer is sharp, meaning that the edges are going to meet at a sharp point with no extra vertices being added to the edges. If we switch it to patch, we can see that the edges still meet at a sharp point, but two extra vertices are added near the point, so the edges and faces are less pinched together. Then we have arc, which basically works like patch, except the new vertices are curved around to smooth the transition. Now let's look at the inner miter options. There's a sharp option, which connects both edges at a sharp point. Point, as you can see here. But if we change that to arc, we can see that just like the outer miter, the connection of those two edges smooths out with an arc. The intersection also spreads out quite a bit due to the spread factor below the arc option. The spread value moves the newly generated vertices along their edges and is not affected by clamp overlap settings, so be careful when adjusting this value. Now that we've covered the miter settings, let's take a look at the rest of this section. Next, we have intersections, which gives you a choice of grid fill or cutoff, with the default being grid fill. Now, if you change that to cutoff, then any and all intersections will result in a sharp cutoff rather than the smooth transition of the arc because it's not going to be creating a grid fill any longer. Then we have clamp overlap, which prevents the amount of bevel from causing overlapping intersections with other geometry. However, like I said earlier, it does not prevent the spread from inner miters. Now, if there are unbeveled edges along with beveled edges connected at the same vertex, the loop slide option will allow the bevel to slide along unbeveled edges. Turning the option off can lead to more even bevel widths, but you really can't see that here because I don't have any unbeveled edges on this object. So that's all for the geometry settings. Let's take a look at the last group, the shading settings. For the shading settings to really be seen, we'll need to turn on auto smoothing for our model. So right click on your object, select shade smooth, and then go to the object data properties tab. Then select the normals dropdown and turn on auto smooth. So if we look at the model, we can see, if just barely, that the top face of the larger cube looks slightly slanted. The faces look slightly angled and you can kind of see a crease right here. This is caused by the auto smoothing of the beveled faces. If we turn on hardened normals on our modifier, you can immediately see a change in the look of the face. This option basically forces all of the flat faces to appear flat and have the beveled faces shade smoothly into the flat faces. This also means that when you apply the modifier, all of your flat faces will be marked as sharp, but hey, you get the effect you're looking for. 
Then we have the mark seam and sharp options, which allow you to maintain the expected propagation of seams or sharps if you have a seam edge cross a non-seam edge and you bevel both of them. Then you have the material index slot to be used for the beveled edges. When it's set to negative one, the material of the nearest original face will be used. To really see those face strength settings, you're going to want to add in a weighted normals modifier and select the face influence option on it. Now we have four face strengths options to look at, and you're not really going to see a huge difference on this model, so I'm just kind of going to explain it, but they work and you can play around with this. First, you have none, which doesn't set the face strength at all. Second, you have new, which sets the strength of all the faces along the edges to medium, and the face strength of newly generated faces at the vertices to weak. In addition to the new settings, if you choose affected, all of the faces adjacent to the new faces will have a face strength set to strong. And then if you choose all, you'll get all of the settings previously mentioned and all of the rest of the faces on your model will also be set to strong. Then you can adjust all of the settings for those faces using the weighted normals modifier. All right, y'all, if you've made it this far, consider hitting that like button. And if you wanna see more tutorials on Blender's modifiers, you can go ahead and subscribe and also check out the modifiers playlist for my other modifier videos. I'm Sir Pinkbeard, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.